Well, uh, Mike, uh, we've been talking about it. It's a hot topic. I heard you on the national radio talking about it today. Uh, where is, well, first of all, is Brissette hurt? I was told yesterday, Fred, that he was in the facility and no, no change. Like that, what what Gerard Mayo had said after the game, that he could have kept playing if the plan wasn't, you know, to just play him for a series or two. Um, and that, like, he didn't come in and, and say, like, this is a problem. So I, I my understanding, status quo with him. So whatever they're doing, I don't think any injury is part of the consideration. Okay. And the second question, obviously, is... Do you buy that there really is uh, like a, a real debate in the with the coaches in the front office about who to start week one? And if, if so, how are they leaning? So I do buy it. Um, I think they're leaning toward Jacoby Brissett. Um, I sort of um, make the analogy, Fred, to like a horse race. You know, like I think two weeks ago we were coming down the home stretch and Jacoby Brissett was so far ahead and like now here comes like Drake May on the outside and they're getting to the the wire and it's like i don't want to say it's by a nose but but Drake May is like making a charge here that at least sparks like a conversation for them to have um i just don't to me it was so much ground to make up coming down the home stretch that i i guess i'd be surprised myself my opinion if they go to Drake May um, but it's at least he's at least made it interesting here the last couple weeks. Who would you go with, Mike? I would go with Jacoby, Dan. I think, you know, part of this is I was looking at it. So when the games, the games, when you watch the games the last two weeks, it, it, it is clear that it's Drake. But then you listen to like Bill Belichick yesterday, and I heard you guys talking about this um, on the prior segment when he's talking to Pat McAfee, Bill Belichick. And he says, like, focus more on the practices than the games. And I thought that was like a really good point by a great coach, obviously, Belichick. Because what are we looking at in the games? We're watching them against second string, third string players. There's no scheming. And I think it's so, you know, in the practices to me, Drake's probably been a little bit better there, too. But it maybe hasn't been as extreme as what we've seen in the games where Jacoby's hardly played. Jacoby's played 27 snaps in the preseason games. Drake's played 66. So in that sense, if you're just looking at the games, Dan, it's almost like an unfair fight. And then I look at it and say if K.J. Osborne, you know, put up two hands, catch a really good pass from Brissett, is, are we even having, you know what I mean? And the receiver ran the wrong extreme? route in the second game, right? With, uh, that was exactly. the reason we were given for the interception. So, yeah, I... And I think Fred said it best, too, right, is that if you look at all the factors, especially opening in Cincinnati and where uh, Alex Van Pelt comes from and where Brissett's been with him, it's it's kind of a no-brainer, in, in my mind anyway, that you go with Brissett, and yes, the future continues to shine brighter and brighter for Drake May. And and at the, and two things can be true, guys. Like at, I heard the clip coming in the segment here from Beetle where he said it's clear that Drake May is the, the best quarterback. Like, the best, like he has the best upside and the best tools, and we've seen them, um, like the most potential. But I think that was true on day one. That's why they drafted him. And it's what Alex Van Pelt, the offensive coordinator, had said is just like, does it? You want to make sure he has the answers to get himself out of trouble, and that's what Jacoby has from being in the system. And I think the safe play, and I'm probably more of a conservative person by nature, would be to just start with Jacoby you know, first few games, see what it looks like, and then you can have the discussion after that. Another story surrounding this team, Mike, is the way that Gerard Mayo is handling this with the media. What is your impression of this? Because he flat out said Drake was the better quarterback yesterday, but now it appears he's not going to start him. So, John, I, I think it's it's just such an extreme from what we had prior. I think he's just telling you honestly what – the, what he feels and what the coaches see like lately or at this current point like Drake has played better than Jacoby but that's not the only factor in making a decision on who's going to be the starter like to me and and I might be in the minority here John like it's a little jarring only because we haven't heard like such honesty and open thought on what they're really thinking 
I think if you know Gerard, that's just like it, it's 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 who he is. It's also I think there's a part of him that he wants fans that are invested in the team to know what they're thinking. Does that make sense, John? Or is yeah, it, or... no, no. What you're saying makes sense. That's that's one point of view. The other is it just seems to me listening to him, and you're there. You physically see him a lot more than I do, and anyone else does. It just seems like he's kind of feeling his way along. There is it doesn't. I don't know how to phrase this correctly. It's going to come out wrong. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of conviction at times. If you understand what I'm saying. It, yeah, it, 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 he might be saying that to the media, but trust me, he's he, just watching him and observing him for the last several months. He's got a lot of conviction, I think. I, I think he really he has a game plan. He knows what he's doing and what he wants to do. I just think he's trying to be as honest with the media as he could possibly be. And I think, John, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think what you're saying is it, it, it feels like there's a mixed message. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah, it's fair. Yes. Okay. And I think, and I think I can understand why people would think that if you're just taking the words at face value, I think like you got to understand who it is. I don't want to say you have to understand, but I think it's understanding who's saying it. Like this is, this is who Gerard Mayo is sort of always been the way he is. And I think, and this is especially extreme for me after listening to Bill Belichick for 24 years, the difference between what we had heard all those years to now is so extreme that it, it almost amplifies it, John. And I don't think it is a mixed message. I think it's just who Gerard is personally. That's my view of it. How much of the decision is ultimately Gerard Mayo's, in your opinion? So, so I, I mean, honestly, Fred, I think the buck stops with Gerard. So it's, it's his decision, but I think he's leaning heavily on Alex Van Pelt, the offensive coordinator, to advise him on the decision but ultimately Gerard's going to be accountable for the decision he's he is the head coach and it, does that make sense i mean yeah, yeah no, no, I no. he's I also mean, relying on them uh, but, you but know, even I, they had a plan fred right no and i, I think understand they're relying on that but yeah, i just yeah, yeah. think bottom let, line let me, let he'll me make ask the what i want to ask because i have a specific <laughs> thing daniel <laughs> all right I won't, I, i'll just shut up over here okay? i would because alex van Pelt. <laughs> Jesus, you are something. Pouting? I mean, I'm not pouting at all. You get a TV guy. You got two TV guys. You got one on the phone. There's no cameras it's, on. It's, well, it's, the no, YouTube people it, can it, see it. It's but... Dan and Mike. They're two TV guys. They're, they're, so they're, yeah. give me the spotlight. Look no, at no, no. me. No, no, you go, Fred. Just Love go. you, Fred. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ahead, I will. Thank Fred. you. Yeah, good. I, I think I, I mean I, I understand Alex Van Pelt's like and he's leaning on him because I mean he's calling him like a you know head coach offense yeah. like. Elliot Wolf, though, with the quarterback specifically, do you think how much does the front office? Because this is the future, right? Does, I mean, Elliot Wolf's tied to Drake May. I mean, Mayo's tied to the team and everything, but Elliot Wolf is Drake May's his future. Uh, yeah. How much do you think the front office is weighing in on all the quarterback stuff? So I I would think Fred that they're in the discussion, and the reason I say it is I think Gerard Mayo has acknowledged that. I think when he was asked this stuff, he uh, this topic, he says I'll talk to Alex, talk to Elliot. So I would think Elliot's in those discussions, but I would think if you're making a pie of of the three people who has the you know the greater say on what the ultimate decision is, Elliot's is much much. It should be much smaller his job is to supply the players but if he's getting into telling them who to play to me that would signal a greater problem all right today's cut down day mike it, it's a, one of the busier days of the year for you to see who's leaving and who's coming in how many starters on the offensive line are the patriots going to wind up with today picking up the scraps from everybody else <laughs> John, I so I actually have a list of four that that I went through the waiver wire to just say who who are some offensive linemen out there that have some starting experience that they might be able to sign or claim. They're not great names, John. So I would temper the expectations like Matt Nelson of the Giants, Max Sharping of the Eagles, Lewis Kidd of the 49ers, okay. Jatire Carter of the Bears. These are the names we're talking about. So I I, don't, I think it's more about a depth player, like a seventh offensive lineman or an eighth, because when you lose one of your top guys, the drop off looks pretty extreme. Um, now, there's a whole nother wave of, of players that are going to get waived that maybe it looks different. But, John, they're not like teams aren't giving away starting offensive mm -hmm. linemen. So I'd, I'd, I'd be temper on that one. Mike, what did you make of the the whole offensive line 
show on uh, Sunday. You know, it was it was bizarre. From I was watching with my binoculars, and and after the the second one, I think by Owenu, or the first by Owenu, after the second, you know, by the line, uh, Mayo went over to the offensive line and was basically showing them exactly what they needed to do, and they came out and did it again, and then they did it again, and then in the post presser, uh, yeah. Owenu was kind of defiant, saying. You know, we we were okay, other than the fact that they kept calling that illegal formation. But and then Mayo was saying how disappointed he was in his offensive line that they couldn't get that simple thing right. I found it it was just bizarre the way it unfolded Sunday night. Yeah, right right after the game, Dan. I I, I think I used the word embarrassing. You know, you're on national TV and you can't line up. I just thought it was a bad bad look for the team. Um, Bad look for the players, bad look for the coaches. And then, like, watch the game over again. And I would say in the first quarter, other than the terrible play where Brissett got crunched, I thought the offensive line, just in that first quarter, like, before they started having the alignment issues, was was not as bad, right? So, like, my I wasn't, I wouldn't be as emotional as I was right after the game when I was reacting to, to that. Um I also think there's another thing in play here, and not to take him off the hook because it was embarrassing. Um, like national TV game, referee who throws a lot of flags, let you know, trying to make a point not just to the Patriots, but to the rest of the league, which you know everyone's watching because it's the only game. Like I could almost see the league, you know, calling up the referee, Sean Hockley, saying, Hey, great job. We needed you to get the point across to the rest of the league. And, you know, the Patriots sort of no, they allowed themselves to get caught in that situation. Got to fix it. But I think there was something uh, that there was that dynamic in play too there, Dan. Can I ask right. one last question, Fred? Proceed. Um, <laughs> you sure? Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, Mike, just quickly. Um, I, I don't know how you feel, but I think that the emergence and continued emergence of maybe your best receiver uh, is Jalen Polk is another positive sign for Patriots fans as we get set to start this journey. Yeah. I, yesterday, um, Mayo was asked about who has caught his eye, and he actually mentioned Polk. And I, the thing about him, Dan, and we've talked about it, you've been at every practice, like not the fastest, not the biggest, but just a good player, right? And I think ultimately he'll probably elevate into that top three um, spot at receiver, which right now they're going with KJ Osborne, Tyquan Thornton, and Pop Douglas. Um, but it feels like he's really coming fast. Thanks, yeah. Fred. And that's the uh, and that's what you want as a fan. I mean, uh, this season, you hit on Polk. You know, you hear May about May's development. These are all positives. I mean, this is a team that's not going to win a lot of games, but you know, there is hope if they hit on these drafts. All right, Mike Reese, thank you for indulging Dan Roach. And uh, keeping the pack that you television people keep between each other and uh, giving him preferential treatment. Thank you, Mike Reese. Everyone watch him on ESPN. Thanks for the time. Awesome, guys. Have a great rest of the show. If you like that clip, and how could you not? Check out more videos from Toucher and Hardy here. Point slightly up and to the left. For more Patriots analysis and opinion, hit this playlist. Point slightly down and to the left. And for the latest from the Sports Hub, download at 985thesportshub.com.